Welcome everybody, my name is Lori Gagne and I'll be bringing you Relic News. It's an absolutely beautiful day in Canada and spring is on its way. I am so anxious to get out digging like you wouldn't believe. So here's this week's episode of Relic News. Right now I'll be bringing you two amazing people. We have Bird Dog and Aqua Jigger. Chris Armstrong, a talented musician, producer, and metal detectorist. He's been in the metal detecting hobby now for about 15 years, but it didn't start off with metal detecting. It started off with Native American artifacts. Here he is. My name's Chris Armstrong, and I go by Bird Dog on YouTube, and I live in a place called Unica Springs, Tennessee, and it's a small resort community that was a resort community right around uh, the turn of the century, um, coming into 1900, and the community was actually started by a Confederate veteran as a, as a spa and resort community here, and it, it lasted as a resort community about 30 years. And uh, there's about eight homes here on the property associated with with the resort community that I live in. So it's an interesting little place in northeast Tennessee. So how long have you been metal detecting for? I've been metal detecting for about 15 years now. And uh, I've been relic hunting uh, since I was a little kid, about 35 years with my dad. We used to look for uh, Indian artifacts in Kentucky when I was a kid, and then uh, we moved to Colonial Virginia, the Yorktown area, when I was about five. And uh, so my interest in history and, and that aspect kind of began there. And what what metal detector do you use? Uh, I use several metal detectors. I, I started with a Nautilus metal detector. I had the Nautilus DMC-1. It was an old model. and uh, my dad gave that metal detector to me. He sent it to me, and uh, that was kind of what got me into metal detecting. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story as to, to how I got into metal detecting. Uh, as a kid, like, like many young boys, my dad and I kind of grew apart once I hit a teenager. We, I went through Boy Scouts and became an Eagle Scout, and some point right after that my dad and I went our separate ways almost and and and, and we really butted heads pretty hard and uh, you know I think that's pretty common with teenage boys but it, it kind of grew to the point where we, we would talk maybe once a year and uh, he was into metal detecting he had been into it about 20 years and he mailed me a metal detector for my birthday. And I was living at the time here in Tennessee, and it sat in the corner for maybe two months, three months, and a friend of mine saw the metal detector and said, well, I, hey, I got a metal detector. Why don't we go metal detecting? And, you know, I thought about all those colonial relics my dad had found as a kid in Virginia, and all these visions kind of popped in my head. And I was like, yeah, let's go metal detecting. And we went to a, a really historic area here in northeast Tennessee, and we didn't know what we were doing. And I just saw the oldest looking house I could find. And coming from Colonial Virginia, I had a pretty good idea as to what old houses were. So we pulled up and knocked on the door, and an old woman came out and said, "Yeah, you guys go ahead." We hunted all day, and and I found a button, a really large button, and I didn't know what it was, and. I came home, and like I said, I, I only talked to Dad maybe once a year. And I called Dad right away. I said, I, I found something with that metal detector. I don't know what it is. I sent him a picture, and he sent it on to Dan Binder from, from a North-South Trader. And it turned out that it was a very, very early Masonic button. 
um, one of one of the earlier U.S. made Masonic buttons, and uh, you know, so I, all this happened over the course of that evening. I got these emails back and found out what it was, and of course, instantly I wanted to go back to that spot. And the very next day, I went back to that spot and found some more stuff and called Dad again, and we've talked every day since. You know, and so it, it was kind of a, an experience that brought my dad and I together and uh, meant a lot to me. It's a long-winded story, but... You know, no, it's actually one of the questions that I often ask people that metal detect with their families, because that's what we do. We, uh, we've we been metal detecting with the kids for years. And I often ask the question, do you feel that metal detecting has brought your family closer together? Yeah, absolutely. It has. And... and uh, if you watch any of my videos ever, you'll notice there's, I, I don't hunt with a lot of people. I, you know, I, I guess a lot of metal detecting for me is kind of getting away from everything. I put on the headphones and everything disappears. And, uh, but with that said, if you watch my videos, you'll notice I do travel a lot to hunt with my dad. And it's because of that, you know, and so now, you know, I talk to my dad every single day now and, and it, it absolutely is the reason that, that I talk to him every day. It, it, it's what brought us back together, at least, you know. Now I call him for random stuff. But so it, it's an important thing to me that that it did bring us closer together. That's awesome. So what would you say your favorite find has been? Well, I, you know, it relates back to that story. It would have to be that button. Um, it's not in particularly valuable. Um, it's, you know, it's beat up. It's in terrible condition. It's from the late 1700s, you know, than that anybody else would look at and think was trash. Um, but to me, that's probably my most valued find to me. I've had a lot of great finds, um, you know, belt plates, and I found a, a really amazing martingale, uh, it's a chest piece off of a horse with a heart. It still has the leather heart, the leather shaped heart behind the brass heart still attached to it. Um, that was a pretty amazing find. Um, I found this last summer, I got into water hunting, you know, and I, I had a really good summer. I found 11 Civil War artillery shells in the water last summer. Um, kind of set out with the intention of finding one. You know, I was like, well, I'm going to try this water hunt now. I want to find one artillery shell in the water. And uh, it took me the better part of the summer. And I, I did find a nice breastplate, a Civil War breastplate in the water as I was starting. And then later in the summer, I finally got into shells there and found 11 of them. I found 10 in the spot that I had been searching. And then I, Bo and I went up to a spot he had, and I found one up there. And that spot I located this summer, actually 17 shells came out of there between my dad, Bo, and I. So it was a good, good summer for artillery. Wow. But like I say, for, for me, the value, the value of, of any find is, is that second you get it out of the ground and you realize what it is. What would you say your most memorable hunt has been? Hmm. Um, I've had a lot of memorable hunts. Uh, it's really hard to, to put my finger on any one. Um, some of my more memorable hunts uh, were certainly the, the very first hunt this last summer when I found the shell. I was by myself uh, in the creek, and I, I found Civil War artillery shells before on land, but like I said, I, I'd set a goal for myself this summer, and that was something I'd never really done in metal detecting, is to have really set a goal and wholeheartedly pursue that goal only. And uh, so throughout the course of the summer, it, the, the fall was coming, and it seemed like it wasn't going to happen. And uh, when I actually found my first shell there in the creek, I, I had no no uh, preconceived notions that I was going to find the shell that day. I was actually just out. It was a beautiful day, and I was going to shoot some video. And I set my camera down in the middle of the creek on a tripod, 
and was just going to take a shot of me walking out away and then back. And uh, I walked out and got a signal on it. You know, the video is terrible. I, it was a brand new camera, and I had it in macro video, which who even knew that's a thing? Like, so anyway, I go out there and I'm standing there forever. And the moment I found that shell, I mean, I was in such shock. I, I had to edit the video pretty heavily because, I mean, I'm out there like, ah, yeah, you know, I mean, the natural reaction. And, uh, but it, it was definitely one of my more memorable hunts. And, uh, just because of the, the anticipation of it, the building up of it all summer of that goal and finally kind of getting a hold of it, you know, so, uh, if you watch the video of me finding my first one, I come out in the creek and I, I find it and I come running back towards my camera and right when I get to my camera, I fall and I, but I mean, I bust my butt so hard and I'm holding this shell in my hand. And when I do, you hear it, like, bounce off this rock. It's like, bam, you know. And I stand up, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> well, I don't care. Oh, my God. Look at that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my gosh. You know, I I found I found like unshot bullets, those little un, unfired bullets, you know, and I found those, and I swear I will not put them in my pouch. I always give them to Eric, and I'm like, here, honey, you want to carry these for me? So I'm not too sure about you guys, but wow, that video really made me cringe. That's insane. That's insane, and I'm afraid of a little bullet. Nuts. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your YouTube channel? Um. I started my YouTube channel, um, I guess in the summer of last year, and I kind of started it from watching Bo's videos. So I kind of started it more as a way to document. I'm having a lot of fun putting movies together, and um, I think YouTube for me has kind of become more of a process of that at this point, as strange as it sounds, but I really started to enjoy the process of making the movies. Um, and trying to tell the story without captions and it's uh, a way for me to kind of pursue all of my interests in one lump place and share it with everybody. And it's, it's kind of exciting to get the, the input back from people when people reply and respond to one of your videos. It's like, oh, cool. And, you know, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but it's, it's like a learning process. So it's a lot of fun. And there's some times where I'll plan and, I, and I've, I've got a notebook that I constantly carry with me for video ideas. That's all the notebook is for, is for video ideas. And sometimes I'll be driving down the road and I'll see a place and I'll be like, oh, I should go there and I'll scratch it down and be like, yeah, I need to do a tour of that place or, or, uh, or like an intro to a video, like how could I start a video and tell the story of me staying up all night in anticipation and then like... As soon as I can get up and go, like getting up and like being like, ah, I got to get out the door. <laughs> so that process is a lot of fun. You never know when you leave, you know, I'll do sometimes like five hours of pre-shoot set up and weird for some stupid shot of me like laying in bed or getting in the shower or, you know, I'll do all these different shots and go out to relic hunt the next day and not find anything. And it's like, well, it's it's a good thing I did all that, you know. I mean, that's awesome. What um, do you have a find that's eluded you? Do you have you have a find that's been high on your wish list, or something that you should have found and you haven't? Or <laughs> well, there's a lot of things I should have found and have not. Yes, but <laughs> um, you know, I think. Uh, Right now, my goal is Confederate artillery from the water. Um, I have found some Confederate artillery before, but not from the water. Um, I'd really like to find uh, an explosive Confederate shell. 
uh, that's that's high on my list this year. In fact, that's that's the only thing on my list this year. Um, so that's that's what I'm looking for right now is Confederate artillery. You said an explosive Confederate shell, like a. Um, so, what do you mean by explosive? Like one that could explode on you? Well, theoretically, yes. Um, I found solid cannonball, a, con a, a Confederate solid cannonball, but I've never found a shell, an explosive shell. Um, like, this is a shell. This is a U.S. Hotchkiss shell, and it has a fuse in the nose of it there. And when they fired this, the fuse, in theory, would have ignited, and this would have exploded. Um, I think... Oh, I, oh, heavy. Here's one that the nose has exploded out of, if you can see. So these were filled with powder and a matrix and little balls. And so when they fired, they would explode over the troops and inflict more damage. Um, so these, these are Union. These were Union shells. This summer, my goal is to find a Confederate explosive shell like that. So. Oh my gosh! Explo the, like the shells and stuff, these type of things. I, I don't know. It, it, it just it's scary. <laughs> yeah, um, and actually, Bo diffused these for me. This is one I found with him um, up at one of his spots. You can see the fuse is still there. I think you can probably see that. It actually still has writing on it. It says J.P. Schenkel, and it has the patent date of 1861 on there as well. This is a different type of shell. It's a Schenkel shell. And you can see here in the side, well, you might be able to see, there's a hole right here where it's been drilled out. So this was drilled out. All the powder's been flushed out of it, and I could throw it off a bridge and nothing would happen. You know, that's that's my new addiction, I think, is chasing big iron. I, I spent the first part of my relic hunting uh, time searching for buttons and coins and things like that on land, and and I, I didn't, I had found some artillery shells, but it wasn't what I was looking for, and now this is what I'm looking for, so... It's just a, like I said, it's it's just a substantial thing, you know. I mean, like in the if if you get to watch the videos of me finding some of the, these shells in the water, it's funny because there's like a limit when you're out in the creek. If you found three of these things in one day, it's time to go because your backpack is tearing in half. I mean, literally, I tore two backpacks in half last summer because they were so full of this stuff. I'm like trying to walk down the creek. I mean, I weigh 118 pounds dripping wet with all my gear, you know. So, like, me carrying a bunch of artillery down the creek is like, I imagine it's funny to watch, but, but dangerous, especially with a backpack full of live Civil War artillery. So at the end, are you part of, um, are, do you have any Facebook groups? Do you have a Facebook group out there? or? I don't. Um, I imagine that we will have one together soon for aquachigger.com. Um, but right now, we, we don't have one up. I'm still kind of juggling, getting everything going with the website and merchandise. And we have a lot of new things right on the horizon that I can't really talk about yet but that are right on the horizon that are going to be really exciting for, for aquachigger.com and uh, for both of our channels, I think. So that's that's just right on the horizon. We're both, both of us are kind of brimming with anticipation right now for it. So um, there's some exciting things coming, though, on the channel, and I'm sure that you will be seeing a face group, Facebook group before long. Uh, another question for you is... Sure. Um, how did you meet Bowie Met? Well, um, like most everybody, I suppose, I stumbled onto his channel and uh, kind of was astounded. 
And uh, so I, I started pursuing metal detecting in the water and sent him some questions, you know, never kind of expecting even an answer. I, he, at the time, he was he was pretty popular, and he's, he's getting more popular as we speak, it seems. But uh, so I sent him some questions, and he, he sent me an answer back. And uh, I started hunting, and I invited him down. I said, I'm not finding nothing. You know, I don't, well, I had found some stuff. I found some bullets in the creek, and I had found the breastplate. And like I said, I I've been hunting fifteen years, so I it was it was like starting a whole new adventure though when I went into the water. Everything was different, and I didn't didn't know what to dig, what not to dig. And I said, "Will you come down and help me?" And uh, he said, "Sure, I'll come down." And uh, so he came down. And we went went for a hike down the creek, and we just kind of immediately got on really well. And uh, he he invited me up to come up and hunt with him. I went up there, and we had a really good trip. And so since that time, we've we've started traveling more together and hunting more together, and it just kind of kicked off a, a really good friendship. So it was uh, the start of something beautiful. But. Can you take it? <laughs> we got we got a ton of merchandise over there and stickers and t-shirts. Bo's gonna probably kill me because I'm not wearing my Can You Chig It shirt. Next I'll be featuring Bo We Met. Some of you may know him as Aqua Chigger on YouTube. Now he's been in the metal detecting hobby now for 40 years and has almost 400 videos on his YouTube channel. But when you check out his YouTube channel, he does have everything classified in playlists. So don't forget to check it out. There is Chig's giveaways, can you ID this, scuba, um, so much more. Now. I asked Bo how it all began for him, and here he is. I grew up on a farm in West Virginia, and as a little kid, I just loved looking for stuff. Um, some of my earliest memories are actually looking for chicken eggs in the nest, because we had free range chickens, they just ran all over the farm. And I always loved going out and pottering across the yard and looking for the eggs and the you know, hay miles and stuff like that. And uh, when I got up to about the age maybe 13 or so, my mother bought a metal detector for the boys. You know, there were like five of us, so, and I was the youngest. And so we got a metal detector in maybe mid-1970s, and that was the first machine I ever had, and I still have it, and it works. I'm only going down about this deep now, though. <laughs> it's a bounty hunter. Um, but that's how I got into it. I mean, I've always been uh, someone who loved looking for treasure and looking for things. And the metal detector was just kind of a natural extension of you know, being able to see what you can't see. Now, when I asked Bull what his favorite find was, I recognized it right away. Now, this video is almost at one million views. The thing that I think most people really like, and probably I do as well, is that coin cache that I found in the river, which was uh, a pile of big silver coins from the um, 1700s and up into the 18, uh, 1836, I think was the last day. You know, big you know, silver dollars, Spanish dollars, dollars from Peru and dollars from France. I mean, it's really cool. and. Nice big pile of shiny stuff, and people look at that and they say, Oh, wow, that's a cool big pile of shiny stuff, you know, coins. And it is neat for that, but if you dig a little bit deeper with that find, it's really, really interesting. The newest coin in the find, uh, you know, not the oldest, but I guess the newest, was 1836, I believe. In 1837, here in the United States, there was a, uh, a panic, a bank panic, you know, a rush on the banks. Everyone ran down to the banks, they got all the money out that they could. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, the coins, you know, the dates start, stop at 1836. 1837 was a panic. The 36 coins, 1836 coins, look like they were mint yesterday. So it's a good indication to me that they were indeed taken out of the bank, probably, you know, 37 or 38, right in the heart of this big financial panic in the United States. So you got that little piece of history wrapped up in this ball there, you know, underneath the pile of coins. 
But then you also have this other like little mystery of why are there all these foreign coins? People ask me them. Why would you be? You know, why would you find coins from France and from Peru and, and Colombia? Um, and the answer is simple. In the 1830s, in the United States, we were still using those coins. The silver coinage and gold coinage uh, was still legal tender up until like the 1850s. So that coin pile now is neat because it's shiny. It's neat because you can maybe tie it back to that you know, panic, you know, the financial panic of 1837. But it's also a time capsule of what we were actually using in uh, our, our coinage at the time. Now, so in 1837, you can take those 200 and some coins and look at you know, the ratios of the different types of coins and where they were from, what countries they were from. And that's the type of information that probably really isn't out there. I mean, for you know, archaeologists and historians to study, we know we use coins from Mexico in the 1830s, but what was the percentage that was out there in circulation? Well, I have this little time capsule. It's all together, and I'm always going to keep it together. And eventually, I hope to donate it to some museum that will display it and, and delve into these different things and look at, look at the historical significance and not just the wow factor of a bunch of silver coins. So that's probably my favorite find, but not really because of the reason you would think. Now, most people think big pile of treasure, but it's not only a big pile of treasure, it's a pile of treasure of you know, historical fact and historical mysteries. So that, yeah, I could say that's probably my favorite find. Yes. Made me go, wow, there's a possibility of that? <laughs> like, so yeah, that was... I'll tell you the truth. I had no expectation of ever finding anything like that. And I'm like you, I'm like, wow, there's a real possibility of finding stuff like this. I mean, that's not anything that was ever written down anywhere in any history books that it was lost. It was just there. You know there's more out there like that. I'm really happy with that find for that reason. <laughs> I'm not a coin man, I'll be honest with you. You're not finding a coin, that's cool, you know, but... Um, there's just something about that, and there's a story to be told there that hasn't really been told. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I can tell you the ratio of copper to silver. Yeah. I found one copper coin out of that bunch. And that may not have even been part of it, because it was a porting area. So, all silver. Big bag of no gold, but a big bag of silver. So, what would you say your most memorable hunt has been? I, I guess the one story I have, uh, the one thing I remember, and I always get a chuckle, was, um, and it really wasn't, didn't involve a relic, but um, one of my friends, your local, I took him uh, water hunting for the first time. This was like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There weren't many water machines around then. So we were sharing my metal detector, and uh, we were in this river about, you know, maybe four feet deep. But it was murky, so you couldn't really see. We were looking for artillery shells, because this is an area I found where there were artillery shells. So I took him there so you know we could find a few together. And uh, <laughs> I was using the metal detector at the time. I, I got a signal, you know, about four feet of water. And so old Tom, he puts on his mask all excited. You know, he's like, it's a shell, it's a shell, right? It goes down underwater, you know, to the area where I told him the signal was. And uh, I feel something grab my boot. <laughs> It dawned on me, and it, he's, he's grabbing my boot, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I laugh every time I, I think about this story. So I just, like, firmly planted it on the ground. I can feel him tugging, 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 and he pops up after a minute. I feel it, I feel it, I can't get it, I can't get it. So go get it again, go get it again, grab it, grab it. So he does this, like, three or four times, and finally he's exhausted, you know, I'm just breaking up laugh. <laughs> I was like, one more time, Tom, one more time. Right? So he goes down, grab my boot, I just slowly raise my leg up, you know. So he gets up, he's holding my boot there, you know, my, you know, my foot's in it, of course. <laughs> that was my most memorable moment, I think. I, that's the one I laugh about when I think about, you know, poor old Tom. And, uh, but there actually was a show there, just out about another two feet. But, uh, <laughs> um, so what would you say inspired you to start uh, taking videos? I found a camera. That's <laughs> what so, I know about a camera. That's really what started me doing the videos. You know, I was out metal detecting and I found an Olympus camera, kind of used today. And so I, I figured, I've well, got this camera, I might as well start doing some video because I never really thought about doing video before. So I turned the camera on myself, started making videos and posting them to YouTube. And as I was saying earlier about the forum, 
the forms are very ugly for a while, especially the relic hunting forms. So I just kind of gravitated to YouTube. And instead of posting all the time on these forms and pictures every day with stories, writing out stories about the day, uh, I can make a video and tell the story that way. And that just became so much more exciting to me because, you know, the people, it was almost like you were there. If you did a video, if you took the time and did the video right, you know, it could, it's not only refining the things, but I could talk to people about what I was finding and why it was exciting or maybe not so exciting. And uh, so it just kind of snowballed from there. You know, I started that maybe seven or eight years ago. Kind of slow in the beginning, you know, I was really busy at work, you know, doing my thing. And, but people seem to like the videos, and when I retired, um, I say retired, but I guess I'm a full-time YouTuber now. <laughs> well, I keep saying, you have a job now. So. <laughs> Let's see. Has there been a fine that has eluded you? A bronze Napoleon cannon is the one fine that has eluded me over the years. I probably never find one. But that's the one thing I'd like to find. Now, the bronze Napoleon cannon was the mainstay of our, the cannons that we used during the American Civil War. Um, it was like the workhorse. And they're very common as far as cannons go, but that's always been kind of the one find I've always wished I'd see somewhere, you know. And I might find one. I mean, it's possible. I go places that they could be, but that's the one find really that. That's a bucket list find for sure. So you're talking about a cannon cannon, like those big cannons? Yeah, yeah. Big cannon. We like not a monster cannon, but they had the Barnes Napoleons uh, that would fire like a six pound round ball. Uh, they don't weigh that much, and the cannons maybe 1,200 pounds or something like that. Uh, they had 12 pound cannon, you know, uh, 12 pound Napoleon, which is a lot bigger, but I mean, they're not huge, but, you know, but a real cannon, you know, that's what I want to find. That's what I was going to ask you. I'm like, how do you plan on digging that up and bringing that home with you if you do find it? Yeah, well, I could do it. I think if I found a 1,200 pound cannon, I'd get it home. <laughs> you <laughs> find 12, it? 12,000 pounds, but a 1,200 pound is sure. <laughs> what is Patreon? Uh, uh, Patreon. Patreon. Uh, yep, yeah, Patreon is kind of interesting. This is something that um, I kind of jumped into just recently. And it's, it's a, um, it's not an organization, but it's basically like a, a Facebook, a subscription-based Facebook, where people who are interested in what you do, whether it be relic hunting, telling stories, uh, you know, knitting, you see a lot of people have like little knitting things, uh, you see Patreon pages for people who make comics and stuff like that, uh, it's kind of an art-related thing, uh, so it's a, it's it, Patreon is basically a, a method of uh, people to donate money um, and to help support people who are making art. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of jumped in on that because I thought it would be interesting to, it gives people an opportunity to donate to my channel uh, above and beyond the way they were doing it. Because I was getting a lot of donations where they would just you know, do a PayPal payment. Here's 30 bucks, here's five dollars, here's a dollar. But when I joined Patreon, it, it, it gave me the ability to give back to those people. Um, whereas before, if I got a PayPal, you know, hey, you're doing a good job, here's 30 bucks, that was it. You know, I can write thank you now, basically. But on Patreon, I have it set up so that it's like it's like a private little world over there where if they make a donation or want to make a donation, they have unlimited access to them. You know, I bow to them that if they ask me anything, I'm going to give them an answer. I can't do that on YouTube anymore. I get a thousand comments a day. I can't do it. That's why it breaks my heart when you told me a story about your kid, you know, and, and loving YouTube and watching my videos. I used to get a lot of that because I answered every single comment or at least every single question up until about a year ago. Every single question. I'd get parents that would come back and say, oh, you know, I'm so happy that you answered little Johnny, you know, because he's got this and that and he's just, you know, he's just so happy and thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I can't do that anymore. I can't get to those comments anymore. But, you know, there's, I get a thousand a day. I miss a day, there's two thousand. And I've got to go through them all. So the Patreon has allowed me to kind of make a different segment. So if you have your kids and they love my videos and they want to interact with me, you can go over to Patreon, one dollar a month, one dollar. And I'm there. I'll answer all their questions. They have questions about digging or whatever. 
I'll be there for them. And um, cool. so that has helped me a lot because people have been able to do that. Parents have been able to do that. And I can still connect. And I can make a better connection. Instead of having a five-word answer, you know, on YouTube, I can write a paragraph. And, uh, you know, just it's working really well. I've only been doing it for a month, and it's working really well. I've got some really loyal people over there, and they just love what I'm doing. And they love that they can have access to me and that, you know, I can answer the question. So, great program. I caught a lot of flack over doing it, which I don't understand why. <laughs> I'm not begging for money. I'm not really even asking for money. Um, but for people who want to donate, they can donate over there. And by God, if they have a question, they're going to get an answer. I'll see it. I check it twice a day. Um, so, it's a good program, and it's really the only only thing that has saved me as far as YouTube, because YouTube has become an area I just cannot get to anymore. You know, a thousand questions, I'm done. I can't do it. YouTube answering questions career was over. Um, you know, I could maybe pick a few, and that's what I did for the last six months. When I post a video, I'd stay in line for three hours and answer as many questions as I could. All the questions on that video, and I go back and dig and try to answer as many questions. Three hours, I'm off yeah. because it just drives you crazy after a while. But the, the Patreon has really helped me with that because I don't feel guilty that I'm not getting to those questions. Um, so it's given me some uh, a great sense of relief that I'm still able to interact with those kids and, and, and people who really want to interact with me for a buck a month. Mm. That's good. So it really organizes all your stuff, and it allows you to give the attention uh, that that you need to give. Um, yeah, I can imagine. You know, you know, I go on Facebook. If I make a post, I mean, my inbox probably just lights up. I mean, I'll get like 20, 30, 40, 50. I'll start trying to answer, and then they answer back. So I can't even make a post on Facebook anymore because I feel so guilty not answering people. It would take a... I feel really guilty not answering you, trust me. You know what I mean? But it's like, ah, you know, I just like, you know, I do, I still love doing it, and I want to, I want to keep doing it. So, you know, I'm going to stick with it, but I just can't get to every question every day now. Especially, you know, on Facebook, I try to at least do as many as I can, like in the morning. You know, I'll take half an hour and answer as many questions as I can, but I can't even get caught up there. You know, it's just great. You know, it's just, it's just our society now. We're so interconnected, and anybody can just, you know, this message out there. And just contact. So wow. So, um, so, all in all, what's your favorite? I mean, I guess it's... Um, Military artifacts would be your favorite things to find? Relics? You know, I. One would think that finding the military stuff would be my favorite. And I really, really enjoy finding that. And I search for that. Part of the reason, though, is because I'm in an area where it is. I mean, I live in the Shenandoah Valley, um, well, just outside the Shenandoah Valley. And this is where a, a big part of the American Civil War was fought. They were. Throughout the entire war, there were troops here, and there were battles here every year, back and forth. Antietam just down the road, Gettysburg just up the road. So that's one of the things that a lot of people in my area look for. Even traditionally, back in the 70s when I was getting into it, that's what we looked for. But I love the military stuff, but I really like colonial stuff, too. You know, the colonial era, the 1700s, 1600s. I really enjoy studying that history and going out there, finding those home sites and finding the buttons and the coins and all the little tools that they would use. So it's maybe not quite on par with the military, but it's right up there. And then again, we talked about fur trade. I mean, that's probably right up there, too, in the copper culture. I mean, everything is, like, right up there, you know. It's all real close. But, yeah, you know, the military is what we have, so that's kind of what I'm doing most of right now. Cool. If people would like to find you, where do, can they find you? Patreon. <laughs> if people want to talk to me and actually have a discussion with me, Patreon is the place to be. Uh, you can go to my Facebook page, and if I can get to you, I'll get to you. Um, and that's really about it. I mean, or YouTube. Like, you know, but again, I have probably a hundred unanswered private messages right now because I just can't get to them all. Um, but Patreon you can get to me every time. I won't take up too much more of your time. I know you've been really, really, really busy guy and everything else and I really do appreciate this for letting me tell some of your story. So. Well, the first person I've done a Skype with, other than like a TV person. so. Really? Really. Woohoo! 
<laughs> you just the barrier. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Well, thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. So I really enjoyed speaking with Bird Dog and Bo. So don't forget to check out their YouTube channel. And I hope that you really enjoyed this episode of Relic News. And we'll see you all next week.